first item on the agenda is S-119, which is the use of uh, statewide use of deadly force policy that we passed during the um, second session. And uh, the House has been working on changes to it. Uh, yesterday, we had a kind of a review of the House changes with the House Government Ops and House Judiciary Committee. My understanding is the bill will be referred today to from Government Ops to House Judiciary, and they'll continue to work on it. But I think it's important that we keep updated on it so we can let them know areas of our concern um, with whatever changes they're making. There may not be time for a conference committee. So um, that's the reason, and I would expect that next week we'll continue to look at whatever they're doing. Um, so we're happy to have Bryn here to help us update us. Um, and I'm going to say it again. I've said it before. If people would like to testify on this bill um, before us on house changes, not on the bill itself, because we've already passed it, but on house changes, please contact Peggy Delaney at P. Delaney at, would you give it to him, Peggy, that it's lg.state.vt.us, is that correct? Correct. P. Delaney at ledge.state.vt.us. Thank you. So. Um, anyhow, the uh, Bryn had prepared a side by side for us. Great. And, uh, if Bryn, if you want to, or if committee, if you have particular questions about sections, when we went over the side by side yesterday, um, why don't we start that way? And then um, if there's, if, if people have absolutely no problem with the changes they made, um, for example, it starts out, our bill was a law enforcement use of deadly force, force policy, and there is a standards for law enforcement use of force. And I'm not sure what the difference is, but um, maybe hmm. we could start there, Bryn. Sure. So um, good morning, committee. For the record, Bryn here from Legislative Council. So yes, that is the one of the changes that the House made was to change the title of the bill. And um, the discussion about the title of the bill and sort of the, the words throughout the bill, changing it from policy to standard, was um, because the bill doesn't go into um, sort of great levels of detail about use of force. You know, a lot of use of uh, law enforcement use of force policies that um, the House looked at in developing this amendment. Um, have really significant amount of, amounts of detail about particular kinds of use of force, like the use of tasers, for example, the use of rubber bullets, things like that. So the House wanted to make it clear that this wasn't um, necessarily a policy uh, that would go into that level of detail, but rather um, standards by which law enforcement use of force could be judged as reasonable. Um, so that they the went to the whole use of force. Ours was focused on the use of deadly force. That's correct. The, the Senate version that passed was really primarily focused on the use of deadly force. And the House tried to expand it a little bit to provide some parameters on just the use of force more generally, not necessarily deadly force. Right. Dick? Yes, Phil. Uh, I have a question. Yes, please. Uh, Bryn, um, I'm wondering, it seemed to me that one of the most dramatic shifts was around the prohibited restraint. And um, our bill obviously prohibited it in all cases. And then we had looked into if someone did use it in self-defense or in defense of others, they had remedies elsewhere in the law. And so as far as our bill went, it was um, prohibited it seems to me that under this bill, uh, it adopts permissive language around the prohibited restraint in the event of defense of self or other. And I wanted to ask specifically about, it seemed to me that what it was saying was, and, and correct me if I'm wrong in this, that in, if an officer feared for his life, which is now the standard reply when any um, deadly force incident happens, um, 
if an officer feared for his life, this says that they may use a prohibited restraint, but they have to cease use of the prohibited restraint once there is no longer uh, fear for their life. Now, in the George Floyd case, what you had was a senior officer who had received training on using uh, chokeholds deliberately to induce unconsciousness. And it seems like that could still, under the House bill, could still be done. In other words, somebody fears for their life, they, um, you know, choke the suspect with the intent of depriving them of consciousness. And then as long as they stop, once the person is unconscious, they would be not breaking any, uh, any law under the House pass, this version we're considering. Is that uh, right or have I put too fine a point on it? Well, um, I think what I would like to, how I'd like to respond to that is to, rather than um, using the words fear for their lives, you remember that the bill defines um, imminent threat of death or serious bodily injury. And yep. that references a reasonable person standard. So remember that it's not a subject, I mean, within, this, within the language of this bill, um, the, the point is not a subjective point, it's an objective point. It, would a reasonable officer in the same situation, in the same so, uh, totality of the circumstances, have believed that there was an imminent threat against either the officer's life or another person's life? Under, understood, but that, that involves are looking, us. If I could just break in for it. Yeah. If people are looking for this section, it's subsection seven on page 12 of the side by side. So um, just to follow that out, um, I, I think that again involves us in um, after the fact considerations of did the officer fear for their life, and if they if they did, then uh, then even though it was a, a traffic stop, they're you know they're uh, able to use a chokehold to subdue a suspect until they're unconscious. Um, the other the other thing I wanted to um, just quickly figure out is um, it seems to me that what this is doing is opening up also the after the fact review. So they've, they've listed a whole bunch of circumstances that need to be taken into consideration. And the last of those, as somebody pointed out yesterday, is any exigent circumstance, any, any pressing circumstance. So it seems that last, I, I can't remember, maybe it's F, um, but that last piece in the list seems to open it up to anything that's not mentioned in the legislation, but that the officer who uses deadly force could present as having been a circumstance that they thought merited use of deadly force. So it, in one way, it's very specific and it lays out a new list, but then the last item in the list essentially says this list isn't inclusive uh, or exclusive, it, it could be anything that after the fact could be made to seem pressing or exigent. Um, and so when I put those two things together, it seems like this bill is a boon to somebody who's trying to defend uh, someone who kills someone through a chokehold. It, it offers them many more options than our bill. Is that is that correct? Um, I do, I agree with your assessment that that subsection F, and this is on page four, subsection F is the last in the list of uh, specific factors that are considered in a totality of the circumstances analysis. Um, I agree that that language is broad and it could encompass a, a number of things, a number of factors that were known to the officer at the time. Um, and, um, I, I agree that some of the other factors listed under totality of the circumstances could potentially be used as factors um, to bolster a law enforcement officer's claim that they were reasonably in fear for their lives. For example, the factors regarding physical characteristics of the officer and the subject, um, could you could also consider that to be 
um, a factor that an officer could use to um, substantiate their claim that they were reasonably um, in fear of imminent death or serious bodily injury. Which one, page four, Bryn, F or? Um... So F is the, on page four, F is that environmental factors and any exigent circumstances. Right. So I do, I, what I'm saying is I agree that that's pretty broad language that could be, that could potentially encompass a large number of factors. Um, and then the one above it, sub, subsection E there is the one about physical yep. characteristics. Um, do you mind if I interrupt for just a moment since we're talking about prohibited restraint? I just want right. to know for the committee that you didn't, um, on Tuesday when you heard the walkthrough, you didn't hear the, um, the last couple of sections of the bill um, because the bill does make an amendment. You may already have read it and know this, that the bill does make an amendment to the new crime that was passed in S-290. Right. No, so I didn't. Know. Yes, I, I think I did know that, but I, it, it's good to be reminded of everything. I'm could you walk through it, And I'm wondering, could we have it on the screen? I know, Philip, you don't really like it there, but I'm, ha I'm having to look at it on my phone. Sure, Alice. So okay, if, if, if people could just shout out if they have a question or comment then, because I can't see everybody. Well, I do. And uh, before we get too far afield from what Philip was raising the question of, Bryn, I understood you to say that this language came from the Seattle law enforcement. Um, I don't know whether that's an ordinance or that's a, a state law. Um, it's, not a state. it's not a law. It's not a law. Okay, this no. is this. So where is this found? So the Seattle Police Department had adopted this use of force policy, um, I believe in 2014, uh, 2014. I'd have to confirm that. Um, but it's it can be found online. I can send the link to uh, the committee if that's helpful. Well, I, I have to say, I don't, I don't find that surprising because it reads like something that was written by law enforcement to uh, bolster potential cases in the use of force. I also understood, Bryn, that there was case law that was surrounding the application of this language. And um, I'd like to be able to read that case law if you happen to have links to it. Yeah, so I haven't found um, relevant like case law regarding a civil suit under the federal statute of 1983 about, um, about specifically for a Seattle law enforcement officer. Um, I haven't found that yet. There are, I have found some interesting cases. There was actually a case um, that went to the Ninth Circuit for the, uh, law enforcement filed a suit um, claiming that, it, that this policy violated their Second Amendment right um, to use their firearm in self-defense. And um, the court found that 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 um, it did not violate the Second Amendment in that way. So I'd be glad to send you that case. And I'm looking for other relevant case law in Washington, and um, I will send you anything that I find. Thank you. Bryn, um, what page should I go to on this? Yeah, let's try to keep, I, I'm getting now confused. I'm trying to keep a list of issues where, uh, and that I'll need to discuss with representatives grad and, and and that maybe Senator um, White will need to discuss with Representative Copeland Hans because bills seem to dwell in multiple committees over in the House and who knows it might even take over in the Appropriations Committee but um, so I'm trying to keep track of where the problems are um, definitely I think we all I agree with Senator Baruth that the idea uh, that we would almost undo our previous law, if I'm reading it correctly. The one that we passed just a month ago um, is troubling. But I also am troubled by the, how broad this becomes yeah. and all the standards. So I'm, I'm looking at, um, so it, it might be better to um, just kind of uh, continue through. So if, if Peggy, if we continue this conversation, I would go to page fifth, uh, page four, 14, Bryn. Page 13 is when section two begins. 
And okay. that's what you haven't had a walkthrough of yet? Okay, why don't we go to page 13 and get that walkthrough, but also, um, since there's, uh, yeah, thank you. Let's go through that walkthrough. Okay, so um, this section two didn't appear in the Senate version of the bill. This is the new crime that was passed in S-219, law enforcement use of prohibited restraint. And the reason it looks like a whole new law here is because it's just a tech, there's a technical reason for that, which is that we're, what it does is it amends a law that hasn't yet taken effect. So the way you have to do it is to um, put, the, put that language back in there as if it's brand new language and then repeal the version that passed in 219. So that's, that's what I've done here. What? Um, so section two is the law enforcement use of prohibited restraint. It's exactly the same as um, the section of law as it passed in 219, save for one significant change, which can be found on page 12. So Peggy, if you don't mind scrolling down to page, I'm sorry, not page 12, page 14. <laughs> sorry. Okay. So um, subsection B, this is the this is a the portion of the new crime that says that law enforcement acting in their capacity in law enforcement who employs a prohibited restraint on a person. And here's the new language. I'm sorry I didn't highlight it. It's in a manner inconsistent with 2368 subdivision C7 that causes serious bodily injury to or death of the person can be held liable under this new statute. So in a manner inconsistent with, that's the only, that's the only change to the section of law as it passed in 219. And what that means is that a law enforcement officer can only be charged under this new prohibited restraint crime if they apply to prohibited restraint in a manner that's inconsistent with that language that we just reviewed in the, in the standard for your law enforcement use of deadly force. So if they use a prohibited restraint um, in a situation where a deadly force was justified and no other intervention was available to defend against an imminent threat of death or serious bodily injury, then they could not be charged under the statute. However, if they used um, that prohibited restraint um, in, in a manner that was inconsistent with that statute and it caused death or serious bodily injury, then they could be charged under the, under the new crime. So that's how they've changed uh, the new crime. So uh, Dick, if I might, well, I'm still stunned. Oh. If I could just be stunned for a few seconds more. Sure. They, they repealed what we just passed that they had agreed to. Yeah. Well, can I, find well, that can I find that deeply troubling that, well, that, that after all the negotiations I went through and being told by the speaker that I could no longer negotiate, that their changes were what they were um, in the speaker's office, that now they repeal it and change the wording. I, I'm deeply troubled. I, if I might just clarify that the reason it is repealed is really a technical reason. And that is because this they are trying to amend a statute that hasn't yet gone into effect. And so for technical reasons, that's why we have to repeal the whole statute rather than just um, make that individual amendment. However, I'm not commenting on the, um, the nature of that amendment. I just oh, want to be aware that that's why it's repealed. What, what I would say, Dick, is it's pretty clear now what their strategy was. They were not negotiating in, I wouldn't say, in entirely good faith, because what they did was they put an October 1st start date uh, to the legislation with the idea that they were going to do this. So that would, in effect, mean that what they agreed to, they never really planned to do. This is just a way of eliminating the agreement that they made at the end of the last session. Um, and so I, I don't like it for policy reasons, but I also don't like it because I feel like they are, you know, attempting to use the fact that we had too many sessions to now try to put us into a position where we have to eliminate what we passed last time. Uh, or, or modify it to the point where it doesn't really have any effect. Right. In a manner inconsistent. Okay. 
So then that's why they repeal justifiable homicide? Yes. Which is what we did in 219, right? Yes. So when does when that. does justifiable homicide be repealed under this bill? On passage. Which we had it um, next October or next July, didn't we? Oh, when does it take effect? Yeah. Yeah, that that also on passage. So they changed that date too. Yeah. So they that that new crime would take effect on passage. No, but justifiable homicide, when is that repealed? Also, I'm sorry, also on passage. So that portion, the other repeal there that you see in section three is yep. subdivision three of the justifiable homicide statute. And that's the portion that provides that law enforcement um, is not liable for the death or injury of a person. Yep. Carried out in a riot or whatever. Right, exactly. Um, but when did we have that repealed? It was next year, wasn't it? If that um, in 219, I do not believe that that was repealed in 219. I need to check that though to make sure. No, they, they did, I believe. Okay. okay. Um, all right, thank you. That completes the walkthrough? Yes. So Dick? Yeah. Um, is it all right to make a, some general remarks or? Absolutely. Okay. So, um, you know, these two bills have always been sitting side by side, accomplishing similar things, one advancing a little earlier than the other. Um, when I look at this, I, I think if push comes to shove and they say either you pass this bill the way we want it, uh, with the changes to it makes to 219 or not, I, I think we should just let it die because I, I feel like what it does is unwrite much of what we did in ways that are damaging. Uh, and and the, the thing that I really don't like is they set an October 1st start date for the prohibited restraint. Um, now they're writing it out of existence in effect by using permissive language where you may use this restraint under a whole series, an articulated series of instances. So I, I feel like this cuts completely across what we've already done. And if we can't change it back significantly, I would be for voting against the bill entirely. Well, I think what we would do is ask for a committee of conference. Right, but but last last time we wound up in a situation where uh, the speaker basically said, "No dice, we're not negotiating anymore. Take it or leave it." Yeah. Um, so I, I'm just saying, if we get into that situation, we should leave it. Oh well, yeah, but I I I think I'm concerned about the broadening also in the Seattle language. Um, are others concerned about that? Yes. I, I'm not going to say I'm concerned about that as much as I am what's actually going on right now here as we're discussing this in the midst of a whole lot of angst in society, trying to pass a piece of legislation that has major impact. And I'm speaking now as a criminal defense attorney one of the things that left me uncomfortable about what we were doing when we passed our version was that we were making a very clear and bold statement, no chokeholds, period, ands, if, buts, or maybes. That's the end of the story. I went along with that because in the process, we recognized that justifiable homicide was still a defense. And that's a court decision. That's a jury's decision at the end of the day. I'm okay with that. What I'm not okay with is we are trying to do something with extremely limited time that might have a very major impact on the life of an officer who is faced with a criminal charge, this felony um, that to me is a very dangerous way to pass legislation. 
We are in the heat of all of the angst. We are limited by what's supposed to be a drop dead date on September 25th. And there are frankly some things in the legislation from the House that I kind of liked and would like to consider at least taking testimony to determine the, the ups and the downs on that. And we don't have time to do that. So I'm really uncomfortable trying to even get to a committee of conference because we don't have time to flesh this out and we don't have the ability to do it at a moment in time when we are not in the middle of the political uh, nightmare that is surrounding us. So I, I guess I'll leave it at that for now, but I'm really uncomfortable going forward under the circumstances we are right now. Appreciate Joe, I appreciate that. I, I feel somewhat. I'm only going to disagree with you to the extent that we have all next week to take testimony on the changes proposed by the House. And I don't know how far we'll get, but I'm happy to start to take testimony um, if you and others would help us to help Peggy and myself to, and anybody else on the committee with suggestions for people you'd like to hear from. I. I'm happy to do that. Um, we only had two bills from the House that we had to deal with. Um, so we do have some time next week to at least hear some voices and make sure that what we're hearing is what what we're hearing. I'm, I'm, I share your concern about the, about this, but I, and I, but I want, I, I do need to understand better where all the Seattle stuff came from. Um, why we would be, why that is. So um, Bryn, if, um, if you and Peggy could get a list of who they heard from on the Seattle stuff, was it somebody in Washington or somebody in Seattle? I mean, I've got connections with the Justice Center. We could hear from some people there too. Um, uh, they, they spoke with uh, Julio from the AG's office about, they didn't hear other testimony about it. Um, okay. I, I would uh, suggest next week um, if, if we could schedule Julio, but uh, Peggy, um, I would also, trying to think, I think there's a board member from Seattle, actually the Justice Center, at least. Um, did any other cities have this? Yep. Um, we, Julio did talk about several other cities that had model or that had a law enforcement use of force policies that um, um, that encompassed a lot of a, a lot of work that had been done with stakeholders. Um, another one was Camden, New Jersey, and Washington D.C. Um, so the House members that worked on the bill and I looked at several of these policies in in creating the amendment. Um, do um, may I ask a question? Do yeah, we have? And, yeah, go ahead. Do we have any um, uh, agencies in Vermont that have use of force policies that um, we could look at just to to see what what their own policies say? Do we know? Yes, the law enforcement. Um, Law enforcement have their own use of force policies. I know the Criminal Justice Training Council has a has a policy for the use of force that they could speak to. Okay. I didn't hear. Are you muted, Ruth? Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, Sorry. I'm wondering if it would help to look at a number of states have passed ban chokehold bans in the last six months. Um, and I'm wondering if looking at the interaction between their new ban and their use of force policies would be instructive because that's, that's what we're doing here is we're trying to harmonize this mm -hmm. ban with the use of force and they, they may have already figured out a better way. That may be. Um, I don't, I can't remember the, the couple of states that I saw had passed chokehold bans, but. Yeah, I'm just looking over our board of the, uh, we have a number of um, police chiefs on our 
board. It seems like we wouldn't want to be, no matter what they had, we wouldn't want to be copying Seattle right now and that they're in such a mess. Right. Absolutely. No, but you also don't want to dispose of um, all ability for someone charged to make a defense. Right. And there's a balancing test that we're going through here. And I'm worried about the emotions that are set up on each side that might right. force us to do something in the haste of the moment that I would be regretting 10 years down the road. This committee has spent a lot of time trying to repair things that happened 15 years ago. And I would prefer that we take the time and ability to make sure we're examining it as best we can, preferably under circumstances where we're all not feeling like we're literally under the gun. Um, Okay, uh, I agree, but I, you know, it is what it is, and um, I, I have to say, I'm, I'm, I, I lean toward agreeing with Joe on that, only because the House has set up a situation where the the path that they're laying out is that essentially the parts I like best from 219 will never come into legal force. In other words, the prohibited restraint um, section doesn't come into force until October 1st. They are, uh, with this bill, looking to essentially write it out of existence so that it never comes into force. So I would be, in that case, I would be for not pursuing this bill and waiting till we come back in January and starting fresh. Okay, um, but I still feel like I want to hear testimony next week from yeah, yeah. witnesses. And um, but you know, I can I can let Representative Grad know there's general concern here, and that if it passes in its current form, that we would need a conference committee. I don't. I think that's the only appropriate way to deal with it. Now, if they choose not to have a conference committee, that's their choice. Um, I also think we should probably talk to our leader, Senator Ash, before we get into too much, too much down the road. But I, I'm still. What does adding? I mean, I think much of what they've done is similar to what we were doing in both 219 and 119. Um, it's the additions that are concerning, correct? Yeah, I, I, I look at it and I think almost all of the additions seem to be articulating grounds for defense of an officer in the event of a deadly force case. So, you know, all of the articulations about circumstances that would need to be taken into account. And it's not, you know, to go to Joe's point, I'm, I don't wanna deny officers uh, a defense, but I feel like what's happened is here they've, they've leaned so far the other way that it, it just seems to me uh, to go almost 180 degrees from the direction we were, we were headed in those areas. Yeah. Have so, any off? Did, did anybody have any testimony on any officers being convicted in yeah. communities where this happened? Where yeah. they have this law? They haven't heard any testimony yet. They just had the walkthrough. <coughs> House, House Judiciary got assigned the bill yesterday and they had their walkthrough yesterday morning and they haven't taken right. testimony yet. So a lot of this came from House Government Ops? Um, no. no the House members that worked on it, on the amendment before it was presented, were primarily House Judiciary members. So this hasn't been adopted yet by them. No. That's good news. 
So I'm, I'm just confused about that process. Yeah. So House Judiciary members drafted language and gave it to House GovOps? Um, so I think that the bill was, a, the, when it was voted out of the Senate, it was assigned to House Government Operations. And during the interim between the close of the last session and the beginning of the August session, some House members worked on um, language to present an amendment um, once the session got started. Um, and so that's how it happened. And the three committees together on Tuesday heard a walkthrough. And then the following day, it was a, um, the chair of the Government Operations Committee asked to be relieved of the bill and assigned it to House Judiciary. And that was agreed to. I see. OK, thanks, Bert. You know, uh, did you are there other states working on this type of language? Um, yes, I do think that other states are looking to um, put standards into law about the police use of force. Um, I can't name all those states right now, but I know that there are other states working on working on this. Well, under I'm going to refer to this as a draft and not as the bill. Under this draft, if a, a person were to um, throw bodily fluids at a police officer or spit on a police officer or whatever, would that rise to the level where the police officer would be able to say that that was a threat of serious bodily injury or death and thereby use prohibited restraints? Um, that's a very factually specific question for a finder of fact to determine. I mean, I think under the circumstance, are you referring to the fact that uh, there's a pandemic going on and perhaps the person could have been infected? Well, that, well, that's been, you know, I know that a number of police officers in Vermont have faced that um, where a um, sometimes intoxicated, but other times just somebody who's got significant anger issues <clears throat> says that to the officer. But we also have the situation in Rochester, New York, um, just that just came out. And we've also, I, and I know having worked in corrections that that's actually a frequent thing that's happened to corrections officers, whether it is a pandemic or not. Yeah, in fact, in the in the jail, they have a spitter cell that has a plexiglass front where they put you if you spit at them. So I, I um, I'm I know because I got put in it. Oh, <laughs> my <a> God! <laughs> when when uh, I got arrested with other people at the protest in Brattleboro at the nuclear plant, my um, gosh! And they put us all in jail. I wound up in the spitter cell. So. Well, Senator <laughs> Bruce, this is, I think this is <laughs> ideal for your next book. Yeah, yeah. Peaceful protest. Um, but it getting really, back. It depends who, on whether or not um, throwing those bodily fluids could be determined to be an imminent threat of death or serious bodily injury, which, as you know, is based on the definition, turns on that um, inquiry about the totality of the circumstances. I'm just curious if, I know Representative Lamond was one of the members of House Judiciary who wrote this. He, he, I think he mentioned that when we were in our joint meeting. Um, so I'm, I'm sure the House Judiciary Committee is, is going over this. Um, other areas of concern, committee? I would just say that I liked 219 in many cases because it made a statement, but it didn't try to articulate or accordion out uh, a whole sequence of circumstances or options. And I feel like this bill tries to do that. And that's usually the places where I have the most trouble um, is where they've tried to open up, expand, or create lists. Um, so I, I, I think that's just a difference in the drafting approach. And I think Representative Lalonde um, 
probably pulled that from the Seattle policy, but you know, for instance, on page four, um, if I if I go back there, it lays out um, totality of the circumstances, and then it culminates in that F, which includes anything that's exigent. Um, I would just strike that that listing and retain the idea of totality of the circumstances because I I, I like that better as I read it. What is your fear, Philip, about explaining or actually setting the parameters on totality of circumstances? Well, so I feel like if you look at our bill and you look at this bill, if you were to ask which which would you prefer to be operating under if you were a law enforcement officer who had just uh, killed someone with a chokehold? I, I think this bill is much uh, friendlier to your situation than our bill. And let me offer this thought. F is, I think the bone of contention. <clears throat> yeah. Um, I don't know whether environmental factors mean something of substance or is it raining or snowing? And you can throw in exigent circumstances and include just about anything under the sun. So I, I understand that that is something that is way too broad. But when it comes to the words totality of the circumstances, um, it seems to me without parameters of some kind, you have the ability to make that argument anyway. And if you have a specific set of parameters, like I'm looking at E now, um, mm -hmm. if I'm sitting next to a, a defendant who has been charged under this, and that defendant is a woman five feet two, and the person that the chokehold was used against was six feet seven and 250 pounds. I, as a criminal defense attorney, I would like to be able to make that argument, but there's no set parameters under our bill on what that actually has um, for me to make that argument at all. Well, that's, so, I guess, that's what I'm saying is it, it presents uh, a, a full sequence of possibilities under which it might be okay to choke somebody. So given the example you just offered, this bill makes it clear that if you are an officer who's uh, somewhat undersized and you're up against somebody who's larger, then it specifically states that it may be okay for you to choke them. Um, and, you know, if you look also, it talks down below about disordered thought. Um, so I have a quick exchange with somebody, and it seems to me that what they said was evidence of disordered thought. Maybe they're high. I don't know that, but I think that. And then I choke them. Under this bill, it seems I have more defense for that action. So that's what I mean, is that it seems to imagine, articulate, and then permit a whole sequence of hypotheticals under which it's going to be okay to choke somebody. But can I throw something in here? Yes, please. It also it also says that there were no other um, available means to to diffuse the situation. So if if you, if you are the the small female officer and you're against this brute of a guy and you had other means to do it because there were three cops standing right behind you or you had a taser or something else it also says that there so so it isn't just that it justifies the chokehold automatically i i, I agree well, i, I want to I, I just want to break in and just suggest that it's all that e is very troubling to me as well um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit of a personal story about why. In my career working with troubled youth, I did 
three what I would consider major restraints. Many times I would talk kids down. Many times I would put my arm around them and say, hey, you know, no problem. We'll, we'll work ourselves through this. The one that was the most difficult restraint was the was a kid who was no more than 98 pounds soaking wet. He was small, but the adrenaline was rushing that he was the most difficult one I ever had. And I had, it took three of us to eventually get him restrained. So, you know, I, I came up against 200 pounders and 150 pounders, but this young kid who was very, very um, angry and emotional. So I, I think size is really uh, immaterial. I also think that um, whether I'm exhausted or not is also immaterial. I don't understand why, um, you know, that's like, what a way to go. I mean, you know, I worked two shifts last week, so I, I was exhausted from that. And I had a rough night the night before with, arguing with my wife. So I was exhausted and I, and that's why I did what I did. I, I just think those are, um, that's a troubling section to me, E. And um, also F. Um, as you pointed out, I just want to point that out in terms of the size. Size, in my experience, doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. So, Dick, but if people... you were sitting on a jury and you were considering that I'm defending a woman who's five feet two and aged uh, 27, and the victim here uh, is somebody that vastly outweighs her, do you think a jury does not have the ability to consider that as part of the totality of the circumstances? I'm sure they would, in a, but I don't know that we need to spell it out by spelling out the words age, size, et cetera, because it may be immaterial. Or was the, person, or was the um, officer exhausted? So, you know, that, I mean, I would, if the officer... If the jury found that the officer was exhausted, I'd sue the city, town, or municipality, or state because they had somebody out there who was exhausted and couldn't handle the job. I mean, I, I think it just is um, very troubling to add those factors in. Um, so, yeah, I'm sure a jury would consider the size and so forth, but I would hope they'd consider the totality of the circumstances. May I ask a question? So without that, that list, I mean, does that answer your question, Joe? And then Jeanette, please. Yeah, I think that we're we're all actually on the same page. <clears throat> we're talking about the nuances of how the language has been set up here. But a jury goes off to deliberate and they're given instructions before they go into the room. And the question is whether or not the jury can be told they may consider the totality of circumstances. In our bill, um, there really isn't anything. It's an absolute ban on chokehold. And you have to go to a separate bill, I mean, a separate statute to determine that, well, yes, we've said that, but there's also an opportunity for a defense under justifiable homicide. It appeared to me that the House was trying to set parameters we may have disagreement with the parameters that they're establishing, but in spelling out totality of the circumstances, it actually sets up proscriptions on what that discussion of the jury would be inside the jury room. So they couldn't go in to talk, for instance, if we struck out um, the clause about exhaustion, they would not be able to talk about exhaustion as one of the totality of the circumstances, whereas here they could. So we're, we're getting into the nuances of what the wording actually is. And I, I think other than that, we're all on the same page that the jury should have the ability to consider totality of the circumstances. We just don't know what they're gonna talk about when they get in there. May I ask a question about that? Yep. So without this, it, first of all, is this list exhaustive or is this includes? And secondly, if, if there isn't a list, what's to uh, 
say they can't talk about anything in the totality of the circumstances. I mean, they can, it seems to me that the defense attorney could, could present the, what he or she sees as the totality of the circumstances and that the jury would have to consider all of that. I, I'm, I'm not sure that, I don't necessarily disagree with the list, but I'm wondering if, if it's necessary. Is it, Bryn, Bryn, is it inclusive or, I mean, exclusive, or is it include these things? And could they, could the defense attorney raise any of these things in the defense case anyway, and they would be considered because they're part of the defense? even if they're not listed? I think the latter is not an exhaustive list. Um, if you look at the language that precedes the list, it says mm -hmm. consideration of the totality of the circumstances may include. Mm -hmm. So um, I read that to mean that this is not the only things that a jury could consider. It could really consider anything that came into that encompassed any fact known uh, by the officer at the time that could be relevant. And, and it would be up to the defense attorney to figure out what those things were and present them in the case. Uh, exactly, yes. Yeah, okay. Dick? So we don't really need the list. The list is kind of implied by saying the totality of the circumstances. Yes, Philip. Uh, so I wanted to go uh, to page 12, um, section seven, the, the toughest thing for me about this bill is the use of the word may there. An officer may use a prohibited restraint. Because if you remember, we had a lot of discussion about what even to call it. And we ultimately decided to call it a prohibited restraint because we wanted to make it clear that it was prohibited, um, that you couldn't use it. This bill says you may use it. So you remember we found out that in Vermont at the training academy at the advanced level, they did instruct in these kinds of holds. And um, that was a surprise to me. And I don't think we should be training for those kind of holds. And under 219, as I understood it, it would be prohibited to teach those holds because you'd be teaching something that was illegal. But under this bill, if an officer may use a chokehold or a hold that cuts off blood to the brain, then it seems like it's a logical leap to say, well, if they may use them, we should train them so that they know how to use them properly. That takes us right back into the world where we're teaching the chokehold to officers who will then choke someone and say, hey, I was told that it was permissible and I was taught the right way to do it. So that, that may at the top of Page 12 is, is what really bugs me more than anything. I understand. Um, I, wanna... I actually kind of liked that because it was followed by, May, May is followed by, but only in a situation where deadly force is justified and only if no other intervention is available to defend. And to me, not training somebody in a situation where they could literally lose their life is problematic. And I, I don't know how to get to the answer of how to resolve where you want to go with it, Philip, but I, this is one of the areas I'd really love to have more testimony in to make sure we're doing the right thing moving forward. Okay. Um, who can... Um, Bryn or Peggy, can you work on who would be a good person to testify about this section or persons? So may I ask, uh, a chokehold does not get, necessarily... Oh. <laughs> Did you get, Bryn and, and Peggy, can you work together on who would be good to, a good set of people to talk about this section? The prohibited That's, restraint in particular? Yeah. yeah. Yep, so I assume that you also want to hear from law enforcement as well as some other stakeholders? Yes. Okay. But but I'm con I want to mention one concern here. If it's okay for the law enforcement um, to train in it, use it, et cetera, what about others? 
Meaning whom? Woodside. Yeah. For example. Yeah. You know, May we, I, oh, go ahead. Yeah. Jeanette, go ahead. Well, using a chokehold does not necessarily mean death, right? Am I, to, do I understand that, that a chokehold can be used without causing death? Yes. Okay, so if, if a, using a chokehold is only allowable when the situation would allow for deadly force, it seems to me that a chokehold that doesn't cause death is better than the deadly force, meaning shooting someone, right? I, I mean, the, if you take that paragraph as a whole, you're saying that in a situation where were there no other, no other possibilities and deadly force was, um, the word isn't allowed, but um, I don't Justified. have it in front, was what? Justified. Justified. <laughs> yeah. If, if deadly force is justified, that the chokehold might be a better option. But the chokehold is deadly force under this bill. But, yeah, but, well, okay. It is deadly force, but it doesn't necessarily cause death. Well, well neither, neither does shooting, shooting somebody. somebody. No, I know. It does. Oh, boy. Phil and I shooting just someone the same is thing. more likely. <laughs> well, um, what I think happens in the use of a chokehold is that sometimes people inadvertently, uh, it causes death or serious bodily injury. Yeah. And I'm not sure that it's on purpose, but using it is very, can be very dangerous. Yeah. Um, and that's why, you know, it's been banned. And that, I mean- Yeah, but the, the choice we're the, being the asked point. to make is, is between banning it altogether or using it only in circumstances where deadly force is justified and if no other intervention is available. And that's the choice we're being asked to make. And I'd, I'd really like to hear testimony from both sides of that argument to figure out where I'd like to go with this. Well, well and back to Joe's original point, where the, the House is not taken, House Judiciary has not taken testimony yet. We're almost two weeks into a five week session. So we're, we're talking about a situation, let's face it, where they're, they're gonna hand us this thing with four or five days left to go, um, which is the position that we wound up in last time where there was a last minute, you know, scrum in the speaker's office and we had to accept the sunset which i really didn't want to but there was no way around it so yeah. what, what i don't like about this whole setup is i feel like they've they've used an effective date that holds off on bringing 219 into force and now we're being set up to accept a bill at the last minute that basically unwrites parts of 219 so, you know, that being the case, I just, I, I feel like unless House Judiciary changes this substantially, I, I would be for not moving it through the process because I feel like we'll wind up having to, to unwrite our own work, which I'm, I'm proud of 219. I think, I think it's a good bill. Um, and I'd rather see it come fully into force and then fix it in January. I wanted um, to um, clarify something that I said earlier, which is that 219 does repeal that um, subsection three of the justifiable homicide statute. And that takes effect the same date that the new crime prohibited restraint takes effect, which is July 1st of next year. Okay. I thought uh, October 1st was when the prohibited restraint crime took effect. The crime doesn't take effect until July, but the um, the other portions of prohibited restraint take effect on October 1st. Right. Okay. Yeah. The crimes coincided under their um, construct. The, the crime that the officer could get up to 20, I believe 20 years. That's right. 
I'm surprised that this bill went in this direction um, and think that the House Judiciary Committee might have, if it was the whole committee, might have sent it in a direction more as to Phillips' liking. And, and maybe they will yet. Um, no. I think they might. It, I mean, I, I don't know who was on, but you said um, Representative Lalonde was on the on a summer group that did the amendment, but I don't know who else. It's hard to know. Hey, Bryn, I'm looking at 219 and I'm looking at the effective dates. Um, so the, it's, it's tricky because you have to look at the repeal date as well. So that new crime of prohibited restraint taking effect yep. on October 1st is repealed on July 1st. And that's the same date that the um, justifiable homicide portion is repealed. So right, so, so am I correct that the crime part kicks in? Uh, October 1st. October 1st, right. Yes, I'm sorry if I, if I misspoke. What I meant to say is that it was repealed yeah. on the same date that the other portion is repealed. Yep. And in the House version of uh, 219, the crime takes effect on passage, which may uh, wind oh. up being a similar date of October. Or do you mean 119? 119. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Could you go to page 10, sub three at the top of the page? And tell, that seems very confusing to me. So this is language that is not does not appear in the Senate version of the bill. Um, it provides that law enforcement has to cease their use of deadly force as soon as the subject surrenders or is no longer posing an imminent danger of death or serious bodily injury to the officer or to another person. Is that the language you're talking about? Yeah. What, that. So that language also came from um, from the Seattle policy. So you can shoot him three times, but not seven? Um, I, you could read it that way, yes. You could I, also. I, I was looking at it in terms of the chokehold. It, it seems to me like a, a way of saying when the person goes <coughs> unconscious, then you have to stop choking them. Um, and, you know, I, I think if, if you go down that path, you're asking for people to not know when someone is unconscious and they slip into death. Uh, yeah, it doesn't say just the chokehold. It says right, but but I mean use of deadly do, force. So I mean, yeah. So whether a gun or a chokehold or whatever, you're putting it on the officer to know when the suspect is not going to continue to resist. They may say, as they often do, I thought he was spasming or, or going to lash out at me, so I shot an additional one, two, or three times. Um, I don't know. It's, it's, uh, I, 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 no. It hopefully may be very different when, by the time the House Judiciary Committee finishes its work on it. But as everybody said, we're in time crunch where if we don't get it done um, in the next week, or at least know their direction, it's going to be difficult to react to. Well, as you said, Representative Lalonde apparently drafted this. Um, I think he's uh, generally very good about checking in with uh, Representative Grad as he works and other members of the committee. So I honestly, I don't expect a big shift in direction from them, maybe some tweaks, but I think this is kind of their, their approach. Okay. And if well, they did have major shifts, then the government operations committee that worked on this would that have to go back. I, I don't know how that would work over there. Yeah. 
But um, Bryn, did government operations even take testimony? Um, not on this amendment, no. Okay. What do you mean they didn't take testimony on this? They have not taken any testimony. They just uh, heard the walkthrough with your committee on Tuesday, and then um, they have not heard anything else about this bill since then. Oh, oh, so it was assigned to them, but they didn't actually do anything with it? Right. They, you know, they had a similar version um, in the House that they did take testimony on um, back in the regular session uh, before we all left the State House. That was H808. Um, but again, that was different from the version that you see right now. That was different from so, the. So who wrote this version? That was that summer group. The the version that you see in front of you, the S one nineteen yeah. House Judiciary Amendment. That was the um, that was the the group of House members that worked on it um, oh. during in in the interim. Yes. Oh, okay. Okay. I, well, we're gonna. Oh, go ahead. This. I, I was just wrap up just, this subject. Okay, I was just going to say I keep reading in the press about the House wanting to slow this process down, and that's starting to make more and more sense to me. Um, <laughs> in other words, January, as opposed to trying to get this out by, you know, September 25th. Yeah, it's, well, it's discouraging. Um, we did, I think, amazing work on S219 and amazing work on S-119. And I think they're both good bills, the way we sent them out. Um, I'm glad that um, with minor changes that S-219 was accepted. Excuse me, S-219. Um, and hopefully, um, at least that's there and that's the law. Um, under if nothing happens with S-119. So, um, but we will try to schedule some more testimony on this bill so that we can be up to date and understand. Um, let me, um, and I will try to get in touch with some people from the Justice Center to see if there's people. Um, I know Marshall Clement, who's the deputy director, lives in Seattle. Um, he may have some contacts with Seattle PD that might be able to provide us or state's attorney out there or whatever. We just have to have them rather late in the, in the day because they have a different time zone than us out there. Um, and they also have um, various issues. Um, I wanted to go to Michelle and then we'll take a short break. Um, for an update on, um, if you remember, we did S-294, which was a major um, expansion of uh, expungement and sealing. Unfortunately, the House, um, for whatever reason, uh, doesn't feel that they can do justice to the whole bill, but after discussions between myself and Representative Grad and others. <clears throat> They've agreed to, to try to do section six and seven, which were the marijuana sections. And so Michelle was going to give us an update on where that stands, if there's any significant changes going on there. We also have, I believe, the, the judiciary, if you remember, the judiciary wanted a million dollars plus to yeah. do S-294. I think they come down to about a quarter of a million to do s to do the section six and seven on marijuana, um, but given the situation financially, I don't see how we can get them even a quarter of a million dollars. Anyway, that's the situation. Hope I to me this is important in terms of social justice. And in terms of the um, S54 conference committee. So, Michelle, I just kind of hand it over to you. Sure. Good morning. So, um, you all should have uh, a document uh, that has, it looks like an amendment 
from House Judiciary to 234. And this is just kind of a standalone, but Eric is incorporating it into the miscellaneous judiciary bill that House Judiciary is looking at. And House Judiciary has mostly approved all this language. I think they're gonna finalize it today. Um, and Senator Sears is correct. This is the two sections uh, regarding cannabis expungement that you had in S-294. And then there is one little addition of a technical correction that was requested by the Attorney General's office, and I'll show you that as well. So, um, and I've highlighted uh, any changes that the House has made, and I'll walk you through those. So if you're looking at uh, what I just have labeled as Section A, this is the expungement section. And you'll recall- Can we put that, that on the screen, please? Can, can yeah. that be on the page? Yeah, yeah give me one. So I'll just talk about it in general for a minute, is that uh, you'll recall that what this does is this is what we refer to as an automatic expungement. And, and by that term, I know that the court gets a little um, a little testy with the was refer, referring to automatic expungement as if you just push one button and everything disappears. And by that, we, we don't mean that. Uh, we just mean that uh, a person doesn't have to petition the court for the expungement order. So, you know, right now under your existing system, it's by petition. And so what you wanted to do and why you included this in S-294 was to provide a process where it wasn't up to the person, the subject of the record to have to go in and petition every single time. And so if you think back, um, so I know that a number of you were around when you did something somewhat similar in 2007, where Senate Judiciary came up with a proposal and it eventually passed on this automatic sealing of a bunch of delinquency records. And again, um, so there is some, some history to being able to do this kind of in one big swoop. And so um, what you have here, and the, the definitions that are in here in this section are modeled after what you have in current law in chapter 230 for the expungement and sealing in Title 13. Um, so we're talking about criminal history records, so, so that's the full record. If you look at subsection B, you'll see the court is to order the expungement of criminal history records for misdemeanor cannabis possession crimes that occurred prior to January 1st of 2021. And that date's important because what we have to do is, remember, there's two parts to this. There's the expungement, and then you're also decriminalizing um, what has been a misdemeanor possession. Because if you recall, when we talked about this before, is that prior to decrim of an ounce or less of cannabis in 2013, um, anything under two ounces that was possessed by someone was a misdemeanor. And so, you know, it's come up a debate, well, can you just or order automatic expungement for an ounce or less because that's now uh, legal. Um, but the issue is that if somebody has in their record, let's say, uh, you know, a 2004 conviction for a misdemeanor possession of cannabis, you can't tell by just looking at that record necessarily, did they have half an ounce or did they have a little over an ounce or did they have just under two ounces without going into kind of digging into the records and looking at the information and affidavit, which is you know, obviously adds a lot more work and cost to the process. And so you have these two parts, which is section A and section B working together so that any record that would be from January 1st, uh, if somebody has a conviction previous to January 1st would be expunged. And then at that same time, the decrim takes effect as well. So that going forward from January 1st, um, anything under two ounces would either be legal or only a civil violation, and then it would be expunged if you had a misdemeanor conviction for the, those crimes. So you'll see that, uh, so then on line 16 on page one, the process for expunging the record shall be completed by the court and all entities subject to the order. So that means BCIC or local law enforcement or whoever also has those records has to complete it within a year's time. So they would have to be done by January 1st, 2022. Um, so you see subsection C is just language that you have that exists with regard to expungements under existing law. So once you expunge an order, it's basically considered to have never occurred. 
Um, you'll see page two on line seven, I have just a little highlighted language there. And that was just to clarify that when the court provides the person who is the subject of the record notice of the expungement, that they're just to notify them at the person's last known address. And that was just to address any concerns that, well, you know, how much time does the court have to take tracking down someone who has a 30 year old marijuana conviction if they can't find them. Um, subsection D, you'll see this has a few aspects of um, uh, that people have uh, expressed some concerns about, about how long would it take for someone's record to be expunged starting on January 1st, because the court will probably do it on a rolling basis. Maybe it'll take it in like 10 year chunks. They've estimated that there's probably somewhere around 10,000 convictions that they would be expunging. And so they'll probably do it on a rolling basis. And so D kind of provides folks who have those records to be able to say, as of January 1st, I no longer have a record. Even if the court hasn't yet completed um, the expungement process and issued those orders for the all the other entities to, to destroy the records. So you'll see on line 12, on and after January 1st, a person who was arrested or convicted for the misdemeanor possession. Subdivision one is shall not be required to acknowledge the existence of such a criminal history record or answer questions about the record in any application for employment, license, civil right or privilege or in an appearance as a witness in any proceeding or hearing. And I see I have a typo there, but I bet Eric probably, the editors probably caught that, is that, um, uh, so that just means that as of, so on January 1st, even though the court hasn't yet issued the expungement order, if someone's filling out a job application, they do not have to acknowledge that, that, uh, that misdemeanor. It will eventually uh, be subject to the court issuing the order and expunging all the records, but for purposes of them having to disclose, they won't have to do that after January 1st. Subdivision D2 is um, the person can deny the existence of the, of the record regardless of whether the person has received notice from the court that they've completed the expungement order. And the top of page three, the can you person- hold on can... there just a minute? Please, oh, sure. I have a question about that. Yep. So the, the person who had a marijuana possession conviction 20 years ago and now is denied taking her grandchild to a school field trip, I mean, assuming we ever get back to those, um, would be able to deny the existence of a record, even yes. if it hasn't yet been expunged. Yes. So, so it will have the effect of expungement, whether or not the judiciary has actually gotten to it. Right. So that person, let's say in the spring, you know, let's say they haven't been uh, gotten their certificate of expungement yet, but they would not have to disclose it on an application. Now, if the school then does a record and finds that there is that conviction on there, um, they would just say, well, that crime, that offense is no longer a crime. And here's this act. And it says I have, I'm under no obligation to do that. And so, right. You know, there's a little bit, of, you know, where we're trying to find a way that can kind of speed up people's relief without having to wait the year for the okay. official order to go out. Okay, I'm sorry I interrupted you. You were on that's a, that's line okay. 18, I believe. Um, no, we just talked about that so that they could. Okay, okay. They now could you're deny on page, page three. Yep. And then uh, top of page three, that just clarifies that if somebody wants to expedite it and they said, well, you know what, I, I do want to, I know I want to volunteer for my kid's school coming up and I don't want to have to wait to see when my number comes up to get expunged, they could still continue to use the existing process in chapter uh, 230 if they wanted to. Um, so whatever avenue is available to them now um, to uh, uh, to get rid of that record, they could still do that if they choose to do that. So just the fact that we that you're adding this is um, doesn't uh, exclude them from that opportunity if they want to do it faster. Right. Okay. Nope. Um, and then no other changes to that section. Does anybody have any other questions about that section? Can I ask a question? I'm just wondering, with regard to someone who, say, wound up going to jail, 
are those records going to be cleared up also, or is that going beyond where, where we're going with this? I mean, I can think of it, you know, a county jail back in the old days or, you know, a municipal jail. I mean, are, I can't imagine that all those records are going to be expunged. You, you, just think, you just deny it? Is that what happens after this? Well, um, the, the court order does go to all entities, whether it's like local law enforcement or department or agency, or whatever, that holds those records. And they're all required under, you know, subject to the order to expunge and destroy those records. So it's under the obligation of those local agencies. I hear you around concern about does that actually happen? Will it happen? Um, but that's kind of an issue with the existing system of expungement that, you know, that doesn't, it's not unique to this. Right. So. I, I think that, you know, clearly we all would look to that, but we don't even know how much of it gets done in practice. I mean, right. there still is, there still are records of the record out there. Um, you know, the Brattleboro reformer could have a story from 1972 on somebody right. that, exactly. you know, if you Google that name, it might come up. You right. can't get rid of everything. Right. But for, the purposes, only... but for purposes of um, legally, you do not have a record once it's right. been expunged. And then also, I, uh, you got to, I don't know what percentage, but you got to assume that most of the time when people are actually seeking a copy of the records, they're not necessarily going to the Washington County Sheriff's Department or whatever, that they're doing a check through BCIC. So uh, like usually a name and date of birth check. So that's available to the public. So BCIC, when they receive the expungement order, my understanding from Jeff Wallen is that BCIC uh, usually completes that expungement within 30 days of receiving the court's order. So I think that most of the cases, you know, again, so once it's gone from BCIC, I think that's what most people would use. So if you're going to, so if your school's going to be, uh, you know, if you're doing a fingerprint supported record check to be a volunteer at the school and they're going to be using BCIC. And so that as the official repository of this, of the state records. Right. So I think, you know, there's always the issues around, you know, how how quickly or how thoroughly to the, do the local folks comply with the order. But I think you're going to capture most of it through, through this. So I'm just wondering, can a person then, if, if you know, two years after this has all happened, um, they discover that they're harmed because someone found out there's a record locally, um, it, does this open up those towns for lawsuits? You know, that's not something I looked at. Again, that's that's just something that would be inherent in the existing process for expungement. And I, um, I'm i only handling like this little swath as opposed to cannabis and Bren usually does the sealing and expungement stuff. So I, I don't know whether or not she's ever dealt with that issue before. Uh, okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. So the next section, section B, is the amendment to the existing uh, marijuana criminal law. And so again, because you can't separate the difference between a, a, a mis an older misdemeanor, whether it was a half an ounce or just over an ounce, right. um, you have to go with the whole misdemeanor and that was under two ounces. And so what you do is you, um, because one ounce now is legal, that's in the bill um, that we passed, correct? Yes. Is so that I, you? We know that. Can we move on to any changes? Yep. I just wanted to tell you the one change I put in here, which is that when I originally drafted this language, you'll see on subdivision A to A, um, nope. I had uh, two ounces and uh, and. I had more than one ounce, but up to and including two as being decrimmed. And then when I went yep. back again and I was looking at it, I realized that the old misdemeanor was under two ounces. And so I just had to just, I had to move okay. two ounces to the, to the civil as opposed to the, as so that's just a little technical tweak, but everything else here right. is the same as what you did. And I will just mention that I had Peggy post, I did do a chart that shows the penalties, which is the 
um, current law and then compared to the language that's proposed here. So you can just see right. if you have questions for folks, you can take a look at that. Um, then section C, this is uh, uh, what was requested by the Attorney General's office and legal aid. Um, uh, so David Shear had made the request and that is under existing law, the definition of qualifying crime for uh, the chapter on sealing and expungement. It lists um, a violation of misdemeanor possession as a qualifying crime. But you, as you know, for cannabis under there, it's not just possession, it's possession and cultivation. Um, and so I think what everybody's thinking is that when this was originally drafted, there was just a technical error and the cultivation part was left off because 4230 is not just possession, it's called possession and cultivation. And so, um, so they requested that that be added back in as a technical fix. All right. And then I just have there as just kind of place just to kind of show you what the dates would be is that the expungement um, uh, would take effect on passage. So even though the court wouldn't need to start working on it until January 1st, at least takes effect and then they start gearing up for it. And then the marijuana penalties takes, a first, takes effect on January 1st. So the decrim takes effect on January 1st, which is the date on which they start to do the expungement. Okay. And that's it. All right. yep. And the court, I asked Peggy to post the... Um, document from Greg Mosley estimating the court's um, uh, proposal uh, on our web page. I don't know if it's there yet. but Yeah, no, uh, I haven't done it yet, but I will as soon as I can. It, it is 245000 So I do have one question, Michelle, um, and you, I, you may want to bring it up with Representative Grad um, and Representative Ansel. Is there a way to waive the Seventy thousand dollar fee to the um, uh, archivist. Right. Yeah, I did notice that. Okay. I mean, I, I, I'm still thinking the judiciary can eat the cost, but if it's going to be a seventy thousand dollar fee to the archivist, I, I'm not sure that you know. Right. Right. So it's seven seven dollars and fifty cents for each. Right for each. Uh, well, they estimated ten thousand. So right. That's where they came up with the ten seventy five thousand. Right. Right. Seventy five thousand seems like a, a lot of money to the state archive that they didn't expect in their budget. Sure. All right. Any questions for Michelle? All right, we're going to take a three-minute break and try to get back. So, State's Attorney, okay. Just so you know, Senator Sears, we took testimony in GovOps on um, uh, DPS on their, nope. um, and we're making um, recommendations. Oh, God, no. Yeah. We already took testimony in Senator Probst and gave him a rubber stamp. Well, we're just what we're all we're. I thought you said that you were going to take testimony tomorrow on that. No, on the modernization plan, not on their budget. Oh, okay. The the commissioner has a police modern, modernization plan. I know we, we've been dealing with it. Well, that's what we were going to take testimony on. Okay. <laughs> So if you missed that part, maybe we'll disagree with government office, just like the House. Well, hey, there's so, nothing. There's no legislation yeah. around it this year, except okay. in 124. OK. We have actually S um, uh, H962, uh, act relating to RFAs. We were marking it up. and. Uh, Senator Benning had a problem with B2 in Section 1, B2. If the plaintiff fails to appear at the final hearing, the petition um, shall be dismissed unless the court makes findings on the record stating why there is good cause not to dismiss the petition. 
and I believe that Eric, Matt, and um, perhaps someone else have worked on some alternative language with Senator Benning. So I don't know who wants to take over, Senator Benning, Eric, or Matt, whichever. I can jump in for a minute if that makes sense. That makes sense. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, morning, everybody. Uh, Eric Fitzpatrick with the Legislative Council here to talk about, uh, as Senator Sears said, H 962, which is an act relating to uh, the duration of temporary relief from abuse orders. You remember the for a moment on the big picture here, what was going on in this bill is addressing the fact that uh, temporary relief from abuse orders only have a duration of 14 days. So that uh, if a defendant, uh, and then, then they have to be personally served on a defendant in order for them to be effective. So uh, if you know, ordinarily there's, there's a final hearing uh, within that 14 day period, uh, and if the defendant shows up, there's no issue because they're deemed to be served with the final order if they, if they attend that final hearing. The issue came up in, in situations where the defendant does not attend the final hearing. Since that temporary order is only valid for 14 days and it expires at the end of that 14 day period, if the defendant doesn't turn up and the court decides to go ahead and issue that final order, uh, then it, that final order doesn't take effect until it's personally served on the defendant. So as a result, you uh, potentially have a gap because that 14 day period is gone. The final order hasn't been served on the defendant yet because he or she didn't turn up at the final hearing. So there's a period of time during which uh, there's no order in effect, and the defendant can go ahead and uh, engage in any behavior that would have been prohibited under that temporary order, and it won't be it won't be uh, illegal, won't be a criminal violation because there is no order in effect during that gap period. So, the the bill, as you looked at last time, proposes to sort of close that gap by saying that um, when there when the court does issue that final final order uh, at the final hearing then the um, temporary order remains in effect until that final order is served. So that way there's no gap, see that? So instead of expiring after the 14 day period, if the court issues the final order at that final hearing, um, then the temporary order stays in effect until the defendant can be located and served. Of course, that's assuming that the defendant didn't turn up at the hearing, in which case there's no, there's no issue. Uh, but but that's what the bill proposes to do. And, and actually, the first thing, before we even get to what Senator Sears was mentioning, you'll see if you look at the language on page one, lines 12 through 15 that's highlighted, this actually addresses, I think, an issue that Senator White had, had brought up and the committee had discussed, which was that <clears throat> how do we provide def defendant with notice that the that temporary order will remain in effect if they don't turn up at the final hearing? So the, the thought was, put in some specific language and you see that it fits in nicely with the existing law there because there's already some provisions about what has to be in that in that uh, uh, order uh, the, the temporary order I should say so you, there's some existing law about that has to contain the names of the court names of the parties etc has to state the, the uh, date time and place of the final hearing so the defendant knows when to turn up and so the the proposal the possibility is to add the highlighted language which just explicitly says um, every order issued under the section, and this is the temporary one, um, informs the defendant that if they fail to appear at the final hearing, then the temporary order remains in effect until the final one is served. And that's just you know a statement of what you've done further on or proposed to do with the legal change, but that way the defendant has some notice of it. So that's possible. And I should point out with this that, uh, and I sent this language to Senator Benning, Senator Sears, uh, that uh, Judge Grierson, I, well, I think he's okay with the language, also noted that um, there is some existing language in existing orders that may cover this already. So he was, he was uh, uh, questioning whether or not, technically speaking, this might be uh, needed or not, since they're in the boilerplate language that the orders already contain. Uh, it, it isn't quite as direct as this, but it does address the issue somewhat. So um, that's something you can consider. Can I ask a question? So anyway, I'm wondering, um, with regard to the defendant, if the, you know, the temporary order then becomes permanent until, well, it continues. So, and does, and does someone continue to try to serve the defendant for 
ever? Or what, what's the period of time whereby someone will try and find that person and serve them? Is, that, is there any guidelines on that? Or might this go on like this for seven years or something? That's a good question. I think you asked, someone asked a similar question to Judge Grierson um, last time the committee was talking about this and he indicated that uh, they, they continue to try, but that, that at a, after a, a certain point, the, the general practice is to, uh, uh, I think the, the plaintiff can continue to seek temporary orders, but the, the general practice is at some point in time, if they can't find them, then it may expire. But I think there, there might be uh, occasional situations where they last for longer. Matt might have some information on that as well. I think the other thing you said, it was the person, you know, it had to keep coming back into the court every, I think every 14 days or something, or, or it would expire. And it sounds like that's going away, but could it go on forever? And also I'm wondering about, is there a fee if the defendant decides he's coming back in to get it changed in a couple of years? Uh, there's no fee that I'm aware of. Uh, it's an ongoing proceeding. Um, but as far as the potential for it to last for uh, longer, I think there is that potential. So the 14 day piece where they would rehear it every 14 days will be gone with this. Is that correct? Uh, which piece? The 14 days. In other words, I think Judge Wearson had said every by every 14 days, they had to have another hearing to keep following up on this in order to renew the temporary order. Assuming the defendant, assuming the defendant doesn't show up, because it's only in that situation. But I think that that's right, that the, um, that the uh, order will remain in effect until it is served. Um, so indefinitely but, until it's served. I think there's that potential. I think I think Judge Grierson indicated that as a practical matter, that didn't really happen frequently. Um, but I think that's a possibility. I, I'm gonna, Eric. I'm gonna ask you to take a look at line 17 on that page. Um, the opportunity to contest shall be scheduled as soon as reasonably possible, which in no event shall be more than 14 days from the date of issuance of the order. I guess I'm reading that to say that the 14 days would still apply even if there was a continuance granted. Um, am I incorrect on that reading? Well, I think that, the, that it still applies in the sense that the, the order has to be scheduled within that 14 day period, absolutely. It's the um, opportunity to contest though that is vested in the defendant. And I, I guess I'm reading that even though a temporary order gets issued and will remain in effect if there's a continuance of the final hearing, that final hearing is still subject to the terms that are on the bottom of the page, if I'm reading that correctly. It's an interesting question. So if you sort of think about how the, the time might unfold. So the temporary is served on the person um, and that's and then let, let language that you just indicated, Senator Benning, kicks in, right? That that the the temporary is served and they have to schedule that final hearing within 14 days. Right. So let's say they schedule it on day 13, um, but the defendant doesn't show. So uh, then the uh, um, question becomes, at least under the language you've got here, is that if the defendant doesn't show and the court decides, you know, because the court could always dismiss it. That's a possibility too. If the defendant doesn't show up, court might dismiss it, particularly if the plaintiff doesn't show up as well, they might dismiss. But let's say they don't and they, they go ahead and issue uh, a final order. Um, then the uh, point of the new language in this bill is that, that the final order we know can't be effective until it's served. So the temporary order is gonna remain in effect until the final order is served. The question is then what, what happens next? Right. Um, they keep trying to serve the person. Let's say they can't locate him or her. Um, does that continue, or do you, you know, sort of indefinitely, as Senator Nitka was saying, or is I'm gonna, that? Uh, I'm, I'm going to anticipate that Alice heard from the same constituents that I did, 
And I think the, the concern was that if a plaintiff, for whatever reason, did not show, and the court decided on its own that there was good cause for continuing the event that the plaintiff has now missed, I'm reading this as in the event the court continues the case, that 14-day language that offers the opportunity to contest is still part and parcel of this package, meaning the court should be rescheduling that within 14 days of the issuance of the order that continues the case. Yes, I agree with that. So that could because if okay. they've reissued the temporary, then the 14 day still re, still applies. So it can't go on forever. And that I, I think Alice, that was the concern that I had heard from constituents. What happens if the plaintiff doesn't show up and the court decides there's good cause? Can it be continued on and on forever? And the answer is, I don't believe so because the opportunity to contest is what's vested in the defendant in that language, not the plaintiff. So the defendant has a right there to say, it's gotta be scheduled within 14 days, if I'm reading all of this correctly. I was gonna say that I agree with what uh, Senator Benning- By every 14 days, it's gotta come up again. That was my reading of it. That's your reading of it. I, I, um... I'm very happy to have this discussion. Um, and uh, I now feel the need to reschedule the reschedule, um, at least hear from uh, the state's attorneys, uh, the, um, the network, and uh, Matt and Judge Grierson on these changes. Um, I think they at least deserve the opportunity to comment. Um, and I would give Matt, if you want to wait till next week, let me take this up again. Yeah, that's fine. Because um, I, I don't want to, I think we're getting into areas I want to, I don't want to end up us getting this to the floor and then having um, hearing from the network that they have a problem with it or hearing from some other group. So I'd prefer to at least have it run by them. If they don't want to testify, that's fine. So if they do, though, we'd be happy to hear from them. Um, let's say next Wednesday morning at nine, at 10 o'clock. It's fine. Okay, Eric, can you can you and um, send that out to them? Yeah. If, and, and ask if they want to testify to contact Peggy. Could, could I ask one question if we're going to be sure. doing this? Yeah. Um, I, I do wonder about whether or not it can just go on indefinitely being rescheduled for 14 days. Right. Uh, to me, there ought to be some sort of limit six months, you know, a, even a uh, final order only lasts for a year. So um, maybe six months, I don't know what it, what the number would be, but there probably should be some time when that temporary order um, expires rather than just going on indefinitely. For the, for the heck of it, Eric, just put in the six months and see what kind of response you get to that. Three, three months, Senator White. Put three, yeah, that, six, that's, nine, that's a good, 12. Because that, that's already six, 14 days. So I'm suggesting that Eric put in three, question mark, yeah. six, question mark. <laughs> oh, okay. Good idea. Okay, so people could comment on either one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that sounds I, good. Yeah, what I mean, uh, yes. Senator White. Yep. Um, and uh, I, I know everybody's saying we've got a drop dead date and everything, but I just don't feel rushed on this. Uh, least, I hope it gets done, um, but you know, I think next Wednesday's fine. We so. Senator Sears, right. when you said on Tuesday from 10.30 to 11.30, the Defender General and State's Attorney, is that S19, S119 you want? No, no, that's their budget. The Defender oh, the General has a big $400,000 hole, and I'm going to try to take it. Okay. State budget. Attorneys. No, I'm, not, I'm kidding. Um, but we need to discuss hole in the state, in the Defender General's budget, as well as um, there may be some similar problems with the uh, 
the, the uh, state attorney's budget. So I thought we hadn't heard from them, and Matt sent me an email uh, okay. regarding the that was a use of CARES fund that's been suggested that it's not a not, can't be used. So what's a hole in this budget? Okay, and then at 11 on Wednesday, you want Julio to testify? Yeah, we'll take this up at we'll 10, 10, and then at 11, put on Julio, and then um, I'll see what else I can find, Peggy. Um, okay. I'm going to contact Marshall Clement at the Justice Center, okay. see if, if there's somebody in Sam, in, in either um, some of the cities that... Um, Bryn mentioned, I believe she said Washington, D.C., Seattle, and uh, Hamden, Hamden, New Jersey. So I, I want to contact Marshall, ask him if he's got any contacts there and be willing to testify. Okay. So we can understand how it works in those cities that already have that type of language. Dick? Yes, can sir. I? Can I, this is off topic a little bit, um, yeah. but going going back to the drop dead date and the budget, um, do you have a sense yet of, so we have about three weeks left, is, is the idea that the House passes the Senate um, a budget in a week and then we turn it around to them in another week or what, what, what are the big I think um, the I think the expectation is there won't be a conference committee and any differences between the two bodies will be ironed out. But so but usually I, you have a, usually you try to get the bill back to the house, you know, in time when we we usually um, they usually say they want a conference committee, um, and then you know. We, we usually confer for two weeks, so that won't be possible. So I think the plan is that that we, we are gonna start marking up the budget in the next week or two while they've still got it, and they're gonna have it on the floor and pass it to us. And then when we've got it, trying to work out any differences. I, I give you one example, the migrant workers payments, mm -hmm. um, the governor put in two million dollars. The um, advocates, as well as Uzana, believes it needs to be five million. So you have a three million dollar difference. But because it has to be general fund, because you can't use CARES Act fund, where's that three million coming from? So those problems will need to be ironed out. And is it in fact five million or two million? Mm -hmm. That's just one example. But what will need to be ironed out because I think they're going to try to avoid a conference committee. Okay. Good to know. Oh, and, and as long as I'm at it, was there any movement at all on the S uh, 54 conference? Um, committee? Actually, we're having a meeting tomorrow afternoon. Um, and I actually have a call in about 10 minutes with representative Gannon. And I'm hoping that there's some positives. We're hoping we're, we have made offers to them it is now there. We need to hear offers back from them um, and where they're at. We're down to about eight issues, but they're very difficult issues like saliva, seat belts, things like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Jeanette or Joe, you're welcome to add to that conversation. We just don't want to be counter pitching ourselves. Right. And also opt in, opt out is a major issue um, taxes. Um, we've actually agreed with them on your after school money okay. that you wanted. Reluctantly. Reluctantly, <laughs> but knowing that Senator Baruth would be behind us if we did agree to that. <laughs> well, uh, f f fair warning, I, I would also push for money for the state colleges, but I'm, I'm I very- I don't think- <laughs> Don't Very, push it, Philip. I know. I'm, <laughs> I'm glad to see the after school money there for sure. Okay. <laughs> we caved for you, but don't push <laughs> to the state colleges. <laughs> all right, we'll adjourn. Thank you all very much. See you tomorrow morning. Thank you. Those of you, you who maybe one. later can't make it, we'll see you then. Bye now. Thanks, Eric. Bye. You bet.